Will our students have empathy? Will they be resilient? Can they face challenges with flexibility? These are just some of the traits Christy and Christine explore in their book, A Mindset for Learning, Teaching the Traits of Joyful, Independent Growth. They say the ideas they're presenting are tweaks, not turns. And the research is based on many authors, but most notably Carol Dweck, who wrote the book, Mindset. We started our conversation about what those tweaks are in thinking about our day, especially at the start of the school year. One of the things both Christine and I are classroom teachers, and every the beginning of every year, you get like a list of all the things you have to get done, right? Like this is your math curriculum, your reading curriculum, your writing curriculum. And like I have like a good like five minute breakdown. We're like, I'm never gonna put this in my day. Um, right. And so then one of the things when we started doing a lot of reading and thinking about this, we knew is that it couldn't be something added in. Because if I added something in, I, I couldn't wrap my brain around the fact that like, oh, I'm going to have 30 minutes to teach Optums. It just, it wasn't going to fit and it wasn't going to happen. And so what we, when we were talking and working with teachers at our school, we found is that it wasn't so much um, changing our day as much as changing our thinking about our day. And so we stopped seeing... Um, we stopped seeing just the explicit aspects of our curriculum. So in this read aloud, we're working on inferring character feelings. But at the same time, we can be working on the ways of thinking about the world. So we could be talking about persistence and optimism through a lens of character. We could use things like a writing workshop share. So in before a writing workshop share might be, can you talk about how you stretched out this word? Now we could say to kids, could you talk about how you use self-talk? How were you flexible in stretching out that word? Or how were you persistent in tackling that problem? So kids started to pick up the language within the context of what we were doing already. It didn't become anything new as much as we started to think about what we did in new ways. And as the year unfolded, we kept hearing and experiencing more examples of this. And so as I read Charlotte's Web aloud to my class, then all of a sudden, instead of talking about just the character of Wilbur or Charlotte, we're talking about empathy and optimism. And the third graders are bringing these ideas onto the table. And then small moment stories suddenly halfway through the unit took a turn where everybody was falling skiing or falling on their bike or having a fight and then getting back up and being resilient. And so it was really powerful over the last few years to watch these stances be woven in not just by us into what we're doing, but also by the students we're teaching. And that's the exciting moment where all of a sudden things are starting to really click and you see it just in the water. And it felt like it was tweaks, not complete mm-hmm. turns. Like mm-hmm. instead of it, instead of my think aloud during a lesson being, you know, watch me as I, um, you know, uh, try to figure out this word, I would say, watch me. I'm going to try to be flexible right now. I'm, oh, that didn't work. Let me try this other way. Mm-hmm. Oh, did you see I was being flexible just then? Mm-hmm. I overheard two kids talking at a table, and one of them was like, you just need to be persistent. And the kid back's like, I'm trying to be persistent. He's like, well, be flexible then. And I just like had this bird's eye view where it wasn't as though I had said to them, you know, like, this is, I had done a 35-minute lesson on persistence, but in weaving it across the entire day, it started to pop up through, it was like in the ether at that point, like in Mm -hmm. the water. Even to the point where parents were saying things to me like, I was really upset about putting together a piece of Ikea furniture and my child told me to be a little more persistent. And I was like, yeah. We've been there. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, be more flexible, Christy. I don't want to. <laughs> well, how do these techniques help with the range of students from the student who's great at school to others who are maybe struggling and need more help? I was a student who was really good at school. And I think that there's even in my childhood, a difference between being compliant, and we see this with a lot of students, being compliant and really being able to kind of do school well and being really engaged in school. And so for even for children who seem like they're really great at doing school, sometimes these tools and these stances are a great tool for reflection, for them to see that there will be a time where some things don't go well. And what can I do? What what can I fall back on when that happens? And then for other children, um, it's really powerful to bring them into our classrooms and then figure out where they are in terms of their optimism or their persistence or their flexibility and use that to gauge what kind of instruction we're going to do for some children. They don't need any more optimism. (laughs) They maybe need a little bit of flexibility or realism. Um, (laughs) And so... 
figuring out where children are and really meeting them where they are is very powerful and it really benefits any child. And for me, I was the I was the other child. I was like I actually spent my first grade a good portion of it with my desk in the hall because I, yeah, I once balled up a piece of paper and threw it at my teacher. True story. Sorry, Mrs. Grimm. Um, so I, what's interesting is that my issues weren't necessarily academics. Like I knew I could, I, my mom was a teacher. I knew how to read. I could write, but I didn't know how to deal with challenge. And Mm -hmm. I still remember I had a write, I had a copy something from the board about Abraham Lincoln. And it was on, um, that like newspaper paper. And I was using a pencil and I tried to erase it. It kept ripping and I couldn't deal with my frustration. And so I balled up the paper, threw it at her. I was out in the hall. And I think my issue wasn't something that was going to be addressed by academics. It was something that was going to be addressed by helping me deal with frustration and failure. And there's kids in our classrooms who are coming from experiences where maybe they don't have a lot of exposure to optimism. They don't have a lot of exposure to flexibility. And so it can be taught and we can help kids so that they don't struggle the way that we've all struggled. Christine and I were talking about how when we first got to college, we were like, hey, what's studying, right? Like not really um, feeling prepared for the, the, the work of, of being a student of learning through failure. And, and um, I think a lot of our work has come from the idea of like one of our most important ideas for kids is that they feel like they have agency and independence in their life. Mm-hmm. And sometimes academics will help kids do that, but also sometimes feeling like you can deal with problems no matter what um, is what kids really need to, to be powerful. And it's just as powerful for teachers. And so every year, especially at this time of the year, I think about going into my classroom and there are inevitably some failures. And when I'm trying to take something new on myself, there are still failures. And it's so easy to slip into that mindset of, I'm just not good at this. I just don't know what to do. And I think we all do it really quickly. And so being able to flip back and be reflective um, about, you know, a lesson that didn't go well or uh, wanting to reintroduce or a new concept or um, walking in the hallway, which there are all these little things that you really need to think about what what's my mindset and how am I dealing with these failures and how can I be reflective about that? And I think part of what I'm thinking about too is like when we have to sort of reframe what it means to be good in school, what school is mm-hmm. all about. Like I just think the classroom is a microcosm of the world you're going to have at large. And it worries me so much to see kids in passive receipt of learning mm-hmm. and in passive receipt of information. And I feel like as people get stressed, as I get stressed about, oh, I have to cover this, this, and this, we lose sight of the fact that these are the these kids are going to be our future. And so looking at the classroom from like, if this was the world, what do we see? Like reframing good in school to mean good in the world and not Mm -hmm. even good, but just like who needs to be in the world? People who have empathy, people who are resilient to, 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 to failure, people who are persistent when they care about something, people who are flexible when they hit a problem. And so when you step back and look at your classroom, It's not who's compliant, who's on benchmark, but it's who's working through problems, who's facing um, a challenge with flexibility, who, I mean, we're not saying that people aren't going to kill children, adults aren't going to feel frustrated or upset, but it's, it's not the feeling. It's what you do after that. And so acknowledging, oh, (laughs) Um, but then being like, and now I'm going back into it. And I just think as we look at the world um, at large and, and sort of what the world needs. It needs kids and people who are going to be like, I know how to stick with this. I know how to make change. I know how to make the world better for everyone. There's something really refreshing for children too about being open and honest with them about their learning. And uh, instead of thinking that learning is this magical dust that you sprinkle over them and then they just kind of grow and bloom, that they actually have to put in some effort and it can be very joyful effort and that there are tools that can help them feel control over that learning Mm -hmm. is really powerful. And I've seen for a lot of students, all of a sudden, they don't feel as out of control and lost in learning. And it gives them permission to be at completely different points than people at their table or people in their classroom and still feel as if they're making growth and that they have some power and control over what's happening. 
And that in itself is really rewarding for them. Sometimes we can't avoid a bad day. How do we manage our mindsets when it feels like everything is going wrong? I think that there's a lot that's been said about um, you, the narratives that go on in your head about how things are going. And so if, and I have been there where it seems like one thing is going wrong after the other, after the other, and you're on the boat and the engine stalls and then you lose the paddle and then it starts to rain and everything just cannot go your way. And very quickly, our brains seem to kind of trick us into this gloom and doom scenario where not only did that mini lesson flop, but also now it's indoor recess and this kid is having an argument with this child and everything seems to be really, really challenging. And it can be. And we're both cl classroom teachers and we know that. And we have both had those days and we will not pretend that we have not. And there's something really powerful about stopping and t taking a moment and reflecting on your own mindset and thinking, is there one good thing that I can find? Because once you find one good thing in your classroom, something little to hold on to, then you start to change the narrative in your mind. And the same things that we, we teach children all about storytelling and self-talk and reflection and goal setting really apply to teachers. And so if you take a moment to say, I'm gonna do a little self-talk, I'm gonna give myself a mantra. And for me, it's like, find one good thing. And once I find one good thing, I can change the narrative and slowly see that ripple across the classroom. Our affect and our mood and what as teachers, our role in the classroom really can ripple out across the classroom as well. And so there are times where you just need to take a deep breath and a moment and think about how your mood is affecting the whole classroom and then bring it back all together. There's some really interesting research that we talk about in the book um, by the psychoanalyst named Philippa Perry. And she has this quote about how... Um, if you aren't used to have hearing good news, you don't have the neurons to process good news. If there's a neural pathway for good news, just like there's a neural pathway for brushing your teeth. And um, I think about that a lot, that if you don't practice seeing the glass as half full, you are, your brain is not processing things as half full. Like it's, it's a fascinating thing to me that like the the gloom and doom person you might know who's who's like oh you're like oh we we got new books oh but i have to put them all in my library mm -hmm. oh we're gonna try something new in math that means i have to rethink what i was gonna do that it's not necessarily you know this person it's that they're not used to having and processing good news and um listen i am like the queen of a bad day two things about it one is that Sometimes you give yourself permission to have to pout. I once heard um, melancholy described as melancholy is the pleasure of being sad, right? Mm -hmm. You put on the cure, mm -hmm. you turn down the lights mm -hmm. in your house, and you pout, basically. Mm -hmm. And I do think there is, there is a way in which that's a healthy thing in terms of rebooting, but understanding that you're making the choice to do that and that there isn't fate at work, right? Being able to say, like, I need a little time to be grumpy about this, and then I'm going to put that aside, and I'm going to move on. And it's naming for yourself the feeling, the experience, and then putting it away and going on with your day and your life. Talk about the research you did for a mindset for learning. Who did you read? We've read a lot. There's a very extensive list of uh, everybody who we read before and while we were writing this book. And every book seemed to lead to another book and every piece of research seemed to lead to another one. And it, we, as we read, it, it was for the book, but it was also for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's like, what kind of person do I want to be and how am I going to be that person? And I think, I do think it's interesting to say that some of the books we came about at to as people. Yes. So like we approached them first as like, I need to get better in my own life with dealing with things. And then as we were reading them, we were like, oh, this seems like it would have been useful to know 30 years ago. Yeah. Huh. I wonder if I could talk to third graders about that. Yeah. I mean, it, okay. it's sort of funny because like, I feel like, especially like mindset, mm -hmm. I, I read that from the point of view of being like, I got to get in gear as a human being. Like, I can't fall apart every time something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Then I read it, and I was like... So, Mindset, Carol Dweck. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, that is a tremendous book and um, filled with tremendous research. 
I mean, I think、um, the world owes her、mm-hmm. a debt of, of gratitude for writing the book in terms of helping people think differently about the world.、Um, Art Costa has done an extensive amount of research onto habits of mind and written extensively about them. And we chose five habits of mind or five stances, but Art Costa has many more. And he has done an ama- amazing amount of work.、Um, Speaking specifically to how those stances affect you as a learner and can be implemented into schools,、um, and then that work has kind of rippled out across the educational community. Another key researcher was Daniel Pink, who's not necessarily an educational researcher, but who's done some fantastic work specifically on engagement. And his book Drive really influenced how we thought about students and autonomy and time and. Mastery and purpose, and not using sticker charts, and, <laughs> and making engagement and motivation really authentic, even for kindergartners and even for third graders. So that was another key researcher. We also, I mean, we also went like out of our regular zone, which was interesting. We read psychologists, we read neurologists, we were reading research studies about how the brain works,、mm-hmm. um, how self-talk develops.、Mm-hmm. I was reading Psychology Today, like a real champ. But it was interesting to think. Oftentimes, I feel like research happens, and then. Teachers don't directly read the research as much as they receive an interpretation of an interpretation of an interpretation of the research.、Mm-hmm. And so, going to read the actual research, we read John Hattie.、Mm-hmm. Um, John Hattie is super influential, and his、um, his book is just like page after page of research. And reading it, and then reflecting on my classroom practice and just classroom practice in general, was just a really eye opening experience for me. I've heard things. I've heard of best practice. But I didn't know why it was best practice.、Mm-hmm. So going to some、um, psychologists, going to neurologists, reading、um, people who are doing studies. Carol Dweck is doing studies.、Mm-hmm. Angela Duckworth is doing studies and reading the actual research was interesting as we thought about our classroom. What does the research actually say? And then what we tried to do was blend it all together. And so we have this work from Daniel Pink and Carol Dweck and Art Costa. And then we have these educational best practices from John Hattie and Lucy Calkins, and workshop approaches that we're implementing in our classroom already. And how can we take all of those, blend them together in a way that is not only easy for teachers because we know that's important, but also really powerful for children? And that was our goal, and we hope we did it. Yeah. <laughs> how were you able to take all of the research and turn it into practical teaching? Trial and error. <laughs> I mean, I think the story about what we did with persistence is exactly right. At first, we were like persistence, 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 and at the at the、enough. yeah, we need to be more persistent <laughs> at persistence.、Um, and then we realized it wasn't working in the way that we were. It wasn't helping kids to rebound from things the way that we were like. Let's help kids rebound from things, right? So then we went back and thought, oh gosh, maybe we need to be thinking more about resilience. There was a lot of trial and error. So much of it was looking at our own practice and as human beings, not just our teaching practice, but our human being practice.、Mm-hmm. I mean,、uh, Peter Johnson's done a lot of work with teacher language and how altering teacher language can make huge differences for kids.、Um, taking some of that work and really thinking about how am I talking about problems in front of the class? How am I supporting kids as they think about things? It really is interesting because the. Co- It just runs perfectly alongside of whatever content you're teaching. It's about the ways of thinking about problems. That's the big shift、mm-hmm. we made. Was like we think about problems in certain ways, right? And so we think about them flexibly. We think about them with optimism. So we tried a bunch of stuff, and when it didn't work, we were like, "Growth mindset. <laughs> Let's、oh, try、wow. something different, right?" Like.、Um, mm-hmm. There was a tremendous amount of talking、um, between us, between our colleagues, and sort of crowdsourcing. Like, okay, so this is what we're looking at.、Um, how do we how do we make this better?、Mm-hmm. And then eventually we found things that seemed to fit well together. And so self talk, you know, didn't work as well as a whole class discussion, but it worked really well one on one in in small groups or in one on one conferences. And、um, then these big powerful ideas. In whole class reflections, really generated some lovely 
ahas in each of our classrooms. I just, I, I just want to jump in. It was such a mind shift to me to not try to throw a strategy at everything. Yeah. To be like, oh, you're stuck on this strategy, strategy. But to step back and be like, how are you trying to talk yourself through this, right?、Mm-hmm. And then intercept on the level of thinking as opposed to like, and like, yes, kids need strategies, they need skills. I'm not saying that, but the way they're accessing that. That was such a mind shift to not try to jump in with here. Well, try this strategy, but to、mm-hmm. say, so tell me how you're thinking about approaching this problem or watching kids at work and seeing, oh, they are tentative to start. Let's try to build up some and like some optimism. So jumping in is not such a scary idea. Thinking about teaching social emotional skills and habits of mind and why it's important. All I have to do is kind of think about myself and people I know in. Cases where failure has prevented forward movement. We all know、mm-hmm. people in our lives who are really, we would say, they're so smart, they're so talented, but they have such a hard time overcoming moments of struggle, fear of failure, that the world never gets to see what they're capable of. And so, social emotional skills, alongside with habits of mind and and、um, all the things we teach in school, are what enable people to to bring their best selves to the world. And to continue to grow and change, and there's all sorts of research that says kids with pro-social skills are、um, pro-social skills are a better indicator of success later in life than even academic skills when you look at it in kindergarten, because who you are is as important as what you know. What you said about not being able to accept good news is fascinating. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, what basically the research says is like anything you do repeatedly, you build really strong neural pathways for. So like. If from your childhood you've been constantly associating silence with anger, silence means anger. When someone's silent, they're angry.、Mm-hmm. You have to unbuild that pathway to rebuild a different one. And so, like, we don't realize that our brain is structured, getting structured all the time. Everything is building st- structures in our brain and repeated experiences. Like, that's why you have to be not careful, but that's why you have to be really thoughtful about like. Helping kids construct positive narratives, especially if they're coming from a household with negative narratives,、mm-hmm. like they're learning, oh, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, and then it becomes a point where it stops being. It now just has become an established structure that it just runs on a loop. What about a student's mindset, grade over grade, year over year? Well, John Hattie has research that's found that a teacher. Mm-hmm. You either have to have one of you either have to have a teacher who's got this sort of mindset with you or a parent. One can cancel out the other. However, the teacher is a bit more tenuous because you only have them for a year. And if next year's teacher feeds the narrative of your home, then you sort of lost the ground you've gained. But teachers who are thinking in this way and helping kids in this way are going to help level out the the. They're going to cancel out. The negative patterns, because you're also going to be building more positive patterns. I think it's really exciting to think about somebody coming in in kindergarten and then hearing this every year, going all the way up into high school. I have friends who teach high school who think that it would just be so powerful to have children or teenagers with these stances in place, just the way that they learn their way of life already in place. And so then all of a sudden the High schoolers as learners are in a completely different place than a generation before. I think that there does have to be some kind of systemic change、mm-hmm. because I've had students who have carried it from one from my classroom to other classrooms and then have brought their teachers along and said, "There's this thing called growth mindset, and that's really powerful." But I think that we do need to call the teachers to really take this on.、Uh, some of John Hattie's most recent research is that. The effect size of having a growth mindset as a student is really small if your teacher does not have a growth mindset, and it's very dangerous as a teacher to teach about growth mindset and then say, "Well, yes, but this student is still a really struggling reader,、mm-hmm. or this student is really not、mm-hmm. that strong at math."、Mm-hmm. And so, I think we need to be very reflective and not critical, but intentional about how we take on this. Powerful、mm-hmm. learning because we still, as much as we want to give children agency over their own learning, we still are in this really powerful role as teachers. 
I want to thank authors Christine Moraz and Christine Hertz for joining me today on the Heinemann Podcast. Their book, A Mindset for Learning, Teaching the Traits of Joyful, Independent Growth, is available now from the Heinemann website, where you can also find sample chapters, infographs, videos, webinars, and many more resources from the authors, including new webinars coming up very soon. You can also learn and join with other readers of the group by joining the Facebook group that the authors have created at facebook.com slash group slash mindset for learning. Thanks again for listening. If you like our podcast, please leave us a comment in the iTunes or Google Play stores. Give us a rating and of course, share it with colleagues and friends through social media. We'd love hearing your feedback. And if you have an idea for a podcast or a guest you'd like to hear, shoot us an email at socialmedia at and let us know. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again.